Last time we covered the official handgun of the Japanese Empire during the Great War, but there was another native design adopted by the Navy. Hi, I'm Othias, and this is Take 5, because this is the Japanese modified Nambu automatic pistol type A, as in alpha. Or, if you're an American and in the collector's market, you can just call him Papa. Let's go ahead and get this over to the light box. With an overall length just beyond 9 inches and weighing in just over 2 pounds, it's actually fairly comparable to the previous Type 26 revolver, although it has 8 rounds of 8mm Nambu in that detachable box magazine. Now, unlike our last episode, this pistol right here comes from the brain of one particular individual instead of a big old commission. And that man is the Japanese John Moses Browning Kijiro Nambu. That's because this man has influenced at least 11 major designs for his home country. And that's in an era when Japan was really trying to enter the world stage. We've actually already covered his personal history in more detail thanks to our Type 38 rifle episode. That was a sublimely simple and extremely rugged rifle that sits on the top of our all-time favorite list. And it reveals a unique genius for efficient design. Obviously, if the man can do this to a rifle, we are going to see perhaps the best pistol of the war. Uh, yeah, about that. Well, uh, let's just get into the history. So, then Captain Nambu joins the Tokyo Artillery Arsenal in 1897, and right about that same time, there's a big push from the top to adopt a new automatic pistol, or at least look into the matter. So this would become the Type 30 automatic pistol plan. Not that the pistol that is adopted will be the Type 30, but it, uh, it's just a naming thing. Anyway, you know the plan here, 30th major year, blah, 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 blah. So by 1897, Japan is looking for an automatic handgun, or at least looking into what it would take to make one. Now we saw in our previous episode, about six years in order to get a revolver off the ground. Uh, we'll see how long it takes this to really work up, but realistically it all sort of so centers around Nambu's ideas more than a commission or any other planning. This guy's got it figured out. Now there weren't a lot of pistols to choose from in 1897, so uh, Nambu would develop two experimental designs, a Type 1 and a Type 2. Now the Type 1, that was mostly based off of say the C96 and the Bergman pistols. It apparently used a three round clip and I have no photographs or drawings of it, I'm sorry. Regardless, it was not well received. The second experimental pistol, the Type 2, well that's a different matter. That guy was a lot like this guy, apparently. Again, no drawings, but uh, raked grip with a detachable box magazine, short recoil locking action, and presumably a C96 derived locking action. More on that in a moment. Both guns were shown, the prototypes that is, were shown at the 1902 Osaka exhibition. This uh, this caught the military attention, not the Type 1, the Type 2. And so they would sort of push for its further development and as far as I understand it, the gun was ready pretty much then. So that prototype must be very close to the gun that we're going to see, uh, not necessarily adopted, but produced. Now before I get into that, before I really start going into what makes an early Nambu, I want to make sure that I say something very clearly. We constantly judge Japanese handguns by 1945 standards. And by 1945, a lot of things had come and gone. 1897 to 1902, the time in which this gun was developed, I want you to be very aware of what was in the market the day that this gun came out, or even near the day this came out, because this is the early, early stages of the development arc for the pistol. So let's take a look. Yeah, look at these guys. I mean, big names, Mauser, Luger, Bergman, Colt, Monlicker, and others. But the designs... I'm not seeing it. I mean, maybe that Colt seems pretty modern, but it is not yet a lock, and nobody knows that that's the direction everybody's going to go. Now, this isn't the first Nambu. This is the second one. More on that in a moment. But, just to be clear, 
it has the primarily same features, enough so that I can say that when we look at that field of guns that you just saw, I will point out this is a short recoil locking action, a very good locking action. It uses a bottle neck cartridge, more on that, but it's a single handed grip because that's what was popular at the time with a steep, easily pointed, easy to gain your sights, tall sights, beautiful feel with a detachable box magazine with the button up here by your thumb. That is all very, very modern. It even incorporates a grip safety, which I know we're not big on these days, but at the time, that's a pretty advanced little feature. So this is a modern, very modern handgun and very competitive handgun for the time in which it was developed. It's just that it overstayed its welcome, but we'll get more on that in a moment. And as a matter of fact, the original version of this gun, the Grandpa Nambu, as we'll see in a moment, that would even come with a shoulder stock. Good old pistol carbine with adjustable tangent sights. Anyway, the locking action, like I said, is short recoil and works off of a simple tipping block. In the Nambu, the barrel extension and bolt recoil together a short distance. In that time, the locking block attached to the extension rotates downward, freeing the bolt to travel on its own as the extension halts. It's been said that the Nambu borrowed from the Italian Glacenti, which actually came later, or the rare Swiss Hostler Roche, which was patented after the Nambu as far as I can tell too. This is because both systems use rotating locking blocks, and the reason that all these systems are so similar is they were all inspired by the original C96. So yes, our Type 26 revolver in the previous episode borrowed a lot, but the Nambu is mostly its own evolution of an existing idea and a distinct improvement, and for the time, a very compact one. Furthering the C96 inspiration, this pistol was paired with a mild 8mm bottleneck cartridge with power somewhere in the neighborhood of 380 ACP. Frankly, this is the weak point in the early Nambu design, as the cartridge does not take advantage of the strength of this locking action. And so with all these features, we get... Well, this, the Grandpa Nambu. These can be spotted from their later brethren by the small trigger guard, wood magazine base, fixed lanyard loop, and the disassembly lever. As we covered, these were also inleted for holster style stocks and those long tangent rear sights. Officially, they were named the Nambu Automatic Pistol Type A. Original Type A production was started in 1903. Uh, that's over at the Tokyo Artillery Arsenal again. Very familiar name to all of you, I'm sure. So, uh, they would very quickly approve these guns for officer private purchase, but they did not adopt them, all right? So, nobody's using an original Type A uh, issued to them. They could buy it for themselves to replace, you know, the standard revolver or whatever, but that's about the best they're going to manage. Now, with support like that, it's no wonder that these guns did not exactly roll out in high numbers. And so, as few as... 2400 were ever really produced, and a significant number of those were actually from Thai contracts. It seems like about 1500 of them were sold over to Thailand, who marked them with their Charka emblem on that front strap. The rest were just commercial sales to domestic officers or ad hoc foreign sales in small numbers. Now, being a refiner, Kijito Nambu actually saw an opportunity to improve his handgun right from the get-go, almost as soon as it was being manufactured. And so he would have an improved version ready in terms of design, but not necessarily practice, before he was transferred out in 1904 over to his another small arms factory. So his design would get rolled out a bit later than his transfer, and that would result in our particular handgun today. That means it was the modified Nambu Automatic Pistol Type A, also known colloquially as the later period Nambu Type Automatic Pistol, these are great shorthand names. The collector's market commonly calls this the Papa Nambu. It has been erroneously called the Model 1914 at times. It's not. This gun actually was introduced as early as 1906, ready to go for production. And there's some evidence of transitional models between this and the previous, but mm, we suspect some concurrent production. Not really sure there either. Lots of hazy details in these old guns. But basically, the old man was done, and the new guy was ready in 1906. Changes included that stock slot being removed, except on some additional tie contracts. A larger trigger guard, a grouped trigger assembly that could all be detached together, a swiveling lanyard loop, a new magazine design with aluminum base, modified recoil guide for easier disassembly, and a myriad of minor adjustments to fit all of these changes in. And of course that means we're here on our handgun today, the modified Type A, 
Let's go ahead and get a closer look. Now, this supercalifragilistic expedaliocious nerf gun of a pistol is pretty wild looking, but it's not all that weird when you think of something like the Glacenti or the Luger. This is a one-handed design, one-hand gripping design, very comfortable actually, despite its odd looks. There's our flippy-do lanyard at the back, and there's our cocking knob. Again, very nerf gun-like because we yank that all the way to the rear to cock. And by the way, if we get all the way back with an unloaded gun, we're gonna get hung up on that follower. There's no separate mechanism for this, so if we wanna release the magazine with this button here, well-placed, by the way, uh, I'm gonna to have to actually pull it out. That's a bit of a bother. Uh, could have stood to have a little extra mechanism in there, but at the same time, we're saving parts. Now, if you look down at her from the top, you'll see she's pretty asymmetric because our recoil spring is set up in here with a rod and guide that then attaches to this side of that caulking piece. So, pretty wild, honestly. Now, the whole thing to me feels pretty dang reliable, pretty good, and on range, we'll get a strong opinion from me in a moment. You'll see at the top, we've got our Tokyo Artillery Arsenal mark, more on that in a moment. Then we got some smaller markings on the side that I'm actually gonna flash up for you in just a moment. But before we get there, I'll point out just a couple features. We've got our grip safety up front that must be depressed in order to reach our hand into this very small trigger guard. I mean, with a glove, oof, and pull that trigger. This has a trigger bar that runs under this section of the gun, and I find that it's just a little bit soggy because of it. Again, kind of like what goes on with the Luger. Short recoil, so the whole assembly comes back a bit before she'll unlock, and then this will come all the way back. And you can see this gun's got some age on it, a little stiffness there, but overall it still functions pretty well as far as I can tell. Now again, I promised you those markings, so let's get a quick look. So on the right side, we have Nambu type and the serial number. And on the left, we have Army type, although this was never officially adopted by the Army. All right, the last thing I owe you on this particular guy is how to field strip it, which is rather unique and requires about three hands. So let's see if we can get a look. First of all, yes, I've cleared the gun. Uh, I've been getting some weird emails here and there as people come into the show new and just sort of expect me to constantly clear this pistol. Just so you guys know, there's a number of takes that go in this show, and sometimes we have to shut down for hours and come back later. So the guns are checked over and over again. If I realistically check the gun the number of times I do check the gun on the show, you would see me check this like five times while we're filming because I've set it down and gone to do something else and come back and just made sure. So yes, I've checked it. I, I feel like I shouldn't have to say that, I'm sorry. So uh, she's clear. I'm popping this mag out and getting it out of our way as things are. Um, I will say a lot of people say you should just go ahead and pull the trigger now and get that firing pin further forward so it doesn't snag when you take this apart. Let me show you something about that. So let's just zoom in. All right, first things first, I'm gonna depress this little guy, and turn him 90 degrees counterclockwise. There we go, and now he can come free. And what this little lock's done is it's taken out our firing pin spring, and it's disengaged this recoil spring and guide from the actual bolt. That's gonna be important in a moment. The other thing is without that firing pin spring, I can just sort of point this down now and pull the trigger and shake it. And I can move the firing pin forward if I need to that way without putting any unnecessary pressure on it. So firing pin's where it needs to be. Gun is all set up. We go to the next more complicated step. This requires uh, sort of opening up that short recoil action. I gotta get this guy to the rear, all right? And then simultaneously, I have to depress this magazine release button all the way in. And then, uh, in addition to both of those, I have to yank down on this trigger guard, pull the whole assembly this way. And while yanking down the trigger guard, I cannot actually pull the safety because it'll fit into a recess in there and keep us from moving down in this groove like we want. This is the three-handed operation. So, uh, I would like to show you on the camera nice and close up, but I'm gonna tell you it ain't realistic. I'm gonna just take a bearing surface, I'm gonna push down on the gun. I'm going to then push into that magazine button. So I'm holding the magazine button pretty tightly. I'm holding down on the gun pretty good. And then I'm gonna start pulling on this trigger guard. And then, uh, being that this gun is, you know, 100 years old, it ain't gonna do anything for me. Uh, I'm just gonna, mm, let me just, no, I get, okay. So, uh, instead of struggling, you're gonna have to take my word for a second as I sort of take this into my lap and give it a quick uh, wrestle because this guy is not entirely cooperative. Okay, it's been about five minutes and uh, what day is today? Anyway, uh, I've got this guy prepped where you can see what was going on. Being a little over 100 years old, there was just a 
bit of a snag in the action that needed to be addressed with some profanity. So let's take a closer look. Again, this guy is back just a bit. See that bit of recession? And this guy is all the way in. And therefore, you can see that I've developed this little gap, which allows me to now pull this trigger guard assembly all the way down and out of our way. All the way down. There we go. Okay. Now, brand new, this process would have been a lot easier, I assure you. However, uh, with the years and the need to sort of get in there and do a little polishing, I think we got by okay. So, uh, we can now just pull this assembly out the front along with our locking block and our bolt. So that leaves all of this magnificence all locked together where we're not gonna lose it. Except, as you just saw, and I want to warn all current owners, this little guy is not always still staked in place. And he likes to hide. He likes to hide so good. So this is actually the pin from that trigger safety. He's just gonna go in there and immediately fall out the other side when I'm not looking. So always keep an eye on him because he clears that wood right there. Now, that leaves us with our lock, which is very simple. It's just a sort of hammer shape with a tab. It sits right there on the extension and therefore locks into a notch in our bolt. This is super simple stuff. Really good core design on this particular pistol. This is sort of the Nambu part of the Nambu pistol. The rest of it's a little weirdly complicated, but this part's really Nambu-y. All right, so that locks out of the way. And then you can tell we fired this bad boy and it needs another clean. So I'll get around to that while we got her pulled apart. But here's our bolt, bolt face extractor. You know the usual drill. We've got our striker down in here would be pressed on from this firing pin spring here. And then our barrel and extension. Actually a very simple system in terms of what we have here. What's complicated is the milling and fitting of this pistol. So while I tidy this thing up and get it put back together, let's look even deeper with an animation from Bruno. I saw you fall right there. All right, let's load our detachable magazine, rack our bolt back and release. As we grip the gun, our automatic safety releases the trigger. As we pull that trigger, take note of this long bar. Sadly, this is why the Nambu, like the Luger, has a bit of a mushy pull. This long transfer bar releases the striker, discharging our round. Recoil carries back the barrel extension and bolt locked together for a short time. This is due to the locking block, hung from the extension. So after a bit of travel, that block falls, releasing the bolt to travel on its own, extracting, ejecting, and then coming back forward for the next round thanks to that return spring. Alright, I think you guys have the gist of this thing, so let's let it wrap out. Alright, let's get this over to May. You know, I know a lot of you are gonna comment about this little action going on on the range. There's a reason, and I can't say for sure if it's down to the Nambu itself or this particular pistol, although I'm thinking this particular pistol. 
especially because of that little pin I was fighting with earlier. Uh, this one, for some reason, the trigger just didn't want to reset unless you let up off that safety a bit and put it right back down. I don't think it's indicative to the entire line, but it's just the reason why you see me sort of playing with it at first and then sort of settling into just rocking it. Now, just don't judge her on that one. That's the gun, not her. Uh, getting back to the history, this particular modified Type A did a little bit better than its precursor, but still at first did not garner any military contracts. So it saw the same sort of commercial sales to Thailand, where, like I said, the Thai copies managed to keep their shoulder stocks. Uh, but in domestic Japan and private purchase, not so much. And it would sort of coast along like that until about 1909, when it was saved by the fact that the Japanese Navy finally came around to adopting this particular pistol. See, it's got an anchor. That's right, the Nambu finally hit it big. It was going out with the Navy. And very specifically, they were inspired to buy these because of limited use of the Mauser C-96 with their special naval landing forces. So these guys had played with the stocked pistol carbine and they kind of thought, well, let's go with that. So if you look at the very, very first of the naval orders, they'll actually have the inletting for a shoulder stock. And then it was later filled in because by the time they actually got shipped, the Navy went, never mind, just pistol only is fine. We don't want the stock. And there was no naval stock made for these. So if you spot one and you see, well, wait a second, why has it been packed with sort of soft metal back here? That's supposed to be there. Please don't remove it and be wary of a naval anchor with that exposed. It means somebody dug it out, maybe well-intentioned, maybe not. Uh, stock pistols take a lot more money in the market because they were actually very uncommon. So green assault with all this stuff. Now, speaking of production, uh, or Tokyo is not going to be the only show in town anymore. You see, the artillery arsenal wasn't in the mood to expand production capacity on these handguns just for the Navy. The Nambu is very complex and time-consuming to manufacture. So another company was brought in to produce. This would be the Tokyo Gas Electric Company Limited. It also brought about radical confusion for later collectors as Tokyo Artillery and TGE started mixing and matching. Now your best bet to understand all this is to check Derby and Brown's book that I've listed below in the description, but I'll give you a brief summary. There are two basic frames for the Papanambu. The Tokyo Artillery Arsenal produced a single piece frame. TGE, however, did a two-piece frame to ease the milling, then combine the pieces before final machining. It takes disassembly to really see the seam, but you can tell at a glance thanks to these panels here on the back of the pistols. The arsenal frames have milled panels, and the two-piece TGEs are flush. Now, Derby and Brown have some good ideas for why uh, that happened and when it happened and when you'd see the frames going back and forth between the two manufacturers or whatever. They have great concepts for why this happened, with evidence to back it up. Not necessarily complete proof, because, well, a lot of stuff was sort of firebombed out of existence at the end of World War II. Can't imagine what was going on. Now, uh, collector survey work is essential to our understanding of these guns. Uh, and on that note, by the way, I keep recommending these books in the descriptions, and I said this with the Type 26. Uh, I'm sorry to say at this point, I'm getting about five to six emails a day, easily on a slow day, about, I have this gun, could you tell me everything about it? And unfortunately, I don't, I'm not, I don't have that good of a memory. These shows are researched, I script them out, I present what I found, it takes many hours to get what I found together for this, and then I'm on to the next thing. So when you show me, I'm pretty much going to watch my own episode again to remind myself, and then you're asking me things beyond that episode, that requires me at a bare minimum to find the books that I used, possibly translate, and then read what's going on. Uh, the shortest possible answer I can give you would take me about half an hour to look into what you're asking me times six of those a day, that's starting to look like almost a part-time job. I'm not gonna be able to get to all those emails. I just can't, guys, as much as I want to. I want to, I feel bad. So uh, this is a good time to invest in your community, like gun boards, share your data, share your serial numbers, share what you found, and then share your love with other people. It's, it's a great way to make friends, too. I mean, I love you all. I can't personally be friends with all of you. It's just impossible. Um, but I still think you're special. Now, uh, anyway. Read the books, engage in the community, it's worth it, I promise you. Uh, back to this. 
There's one other issue about these guns that I want to talk about, because I'm not getting into every little variation and tick and turn, again, books and community. Uh, but there is something that might confuse you, which is that some of these are marked for TGE, and they're obviously naval contract, and, well, style. They don't have the anchor or anything. Instead, they have uh, the cannonball on the side. Now you're going, well, why do I have you know, TGE and cannonball? Well, Derby and Brown have a pretty good explanation for that, too. Most likely, these were supplied from TGE to the Army for their private purchase programs. The Arsenal-made guns were Arsenal quality to begin with, but the commercial TGEs, well, they would need to be inspected by Army officers and approved, so therefore approved by the Tokyo Artillery Arsenal. That satisfies the Army's requisite, probably. All right, so we've trucked through most of the development history for this gun, except for I'm leaving you with one glaring question so far. I'm sure some of you have been carrying this through almost the whole episode. If this is the type A, what's the type B? Well, the B stands for baby, at least as far as the US collectors are concerned. This is the seven millimeter cartridge micro Nambu that was produced as a smaller, lighter, and less combatty officer's pistol. These were terribly expensive compared to other commercial pistols available, and so not particularly common in the war. The Type B actually entered full production in 1909, about the time of the Navy adoption of its big brother. But it was never officially adopted and remained a private purchase only. Likely some 6,500 were ever produced. Uh, strangely, we actually have fired one of these guys, but not for the show. Sorry, it was before all this. Uh, but maybe May can give us a slight opinion. And that, my friends... Ooh. Hey, I am telling you, I grew up with Nerf guns as a kid, and this hits all the right buttons. Uh, that is the state of this particular handgun when war were declared. Now, this is going to be like last episode. I want to tell you all sorts of wonderful things or terrible things about this gun's role in the war, but it's practically null. The Japanese really didn't think of their handguns as a first line anything. I mean, if, well, I'm going to say the sad truth this is probably more often used against like disobedient soldiers or captives or something. I mean, this is really. The, this is not a doctrinally combat used thing for the Japanese army, and there's probably not a lot of mention of any use of these guns, not that I could find. Uh, I'm sure they worked as well as any other early auto loader at the time. And we'll get May's opinion on actually handling and shooting this thing. And we'll have to sort of conjecture from there because I just don't want to speak out of turn. I don't want to sit here and blow you up on stuff I don't have and wasn't able to turn up. Sometimes people just don't write about this ancillary stuff when there's a whole war going on. But anyway, they were fairly long lived in terms of their contract purchases because you're saying 1902, commercial sales, 1909 adoption, and then they would make it through World War I. So we're seeing involvement in uh, Manchurian invasion, Second Sino-Japanese War, and then they were even held on to by many people through World War II. Otherwise, why else would we have enough to collect in the US? I mean, they have to be hauled back. So these guns were out there all the way up until 1945, along with the Type 26 Brethren, and then later editions. As a matter of fact, this gun never saw wide adoption because, well, it was adapted for wide adoption. This gun was reworked in the 1920s to come up with a new gun based on the same technology, just redistributed, and that would be the Type 14 that we all know and not quite love. And again, if you're regular viewers, this next part is going to be a little redundant, but I want to make sure that I cover it in case this is the only video you're watching. By 1923, early 1923, the Japanese army especially was concerned about dispersing its production. Everything was piled up in Tokyo. This was a vulnerable point. I mean, if you lose that city to whatever, you lose a lot of capacity. Well, it's a very good thing that they thought of that because that's exactly what happened later that same year in September when the great Kanto earthquake came rolling through. Talked about this last time. Uh, tidal waves and destruction caused very little actual death or material loss. Instead, lunchtime means the charcoals were burning and then the city along with it when they got tossed out of the grill. So firestorms killed 144,000 plus people and wrecked the city for, I mean, you're talking about years of reconstruction efforts to get this stuff back to where it had 
spin. And as part of that, this gun would suffer because what's the point in retooling up this production all over again when you already have designs on the table for another simplified, easier to manufacture, improved pistol. And again, that leads us to the Type 14. Again, like the 26, only a few hundred assembled after the quake. Maybe as few as five or as many as five. That's sort of the ballpark figure as far as surveyors seem to be able to figure out on this. Now, uh, we're getting towards the end of this, so let's just recap and figure out how many of these are made and where. Total production from Tokyo Artillery Arsenal was about 4,600 units, and Tokyo Gas Electric managed 5,700 or so. The grand total of 10,300, give or take, isn't particularly impressive compared to other contracts we've seen in this series, but again, the Japanese weren't big on effective handgun use in war, and these still are pretty significant compared to anything else that was around in the theater. Kijiro Nambu the Man would continue to rise in rank, eventually leading to Lieutenant General. He stayed involved in various arms designs, many of which we hope to cover in the future in this show. I'll uh, leave us today with his military retirement in December of 1924. Although from there he would create his own commercial factory to supply the Empire and keep his hand in the game. So that leads us with actually one of the earliest auto-loading handguns, 1902, and then some improvements that start manufacture in 1906 that is still very, very, very early. I mean, 1911 is 1911. That's not bad. And then you saw the gun shot, and we'll talk about it in a moment, but realistically, as alien and bizarre and as laughable as it is with its weak cartridge, which, by the way, the real sob story of this whole thing is not that the Nambu action stayed around. It's not that the Nambu action stayed around with some problems that we could talk about in a Type 14 episode. The problem is the cartridge stuck around. I don't know why you need a lock breech this heavy for something that's equating 380 in power. It just seems like a waste of a perfectly good action. I'm not sure what the stress limit was to getting this thing dialed up to a nice straight-walled heavy hitter of a cartridge, other than... Nobody felt like doing it in the Japanese Empire. I think there's a lot of sort of nepotism that leads to some of the weird decisions around this gun, despite the good designs. Anyway, this gun is wrapped up for today. We'll talk later about its descendants and its cartridges, but that's outside of World War I. Instead, we need to go and turn this over to May. But before we go there, I want to leave you with one interesting little tidbit, which is that because these guns were marked Army type, despite never being adopted by the Army, the Navy kind of referred to them as the Army type. Now, because the Navy actually did adopt them, often the Army would refer to them as the Navy type. The names on these guns is unbelievable. All right, so let's go ahead and get this over to May and get her opinion on this gun. All right, once more, we've made room for May, and we have a beautiful, if not unusual, Japanese Nambu 1902, well, modified Type A. The names on this gun, let me tell you. So it's time to get your opinion on probably the weirdest handgun that we've had up until this point in the series, and probably the most mysterious for a lot of people, because those are not common guns. So you've shot the elusive Papa Nambu. How are you feeling about the gun as a whole, starting as usual as we do in this show, with the ergonomics, the general fit and feel when you first lay it in your hand? When first handed this gun, it feels a lot like a Lottie or a Luger. I mean, feels-wise, looks-wise, it's all there, and it feels fantastic, let me tell you. All the weight centered right here on top of your hand, so you really don't notice any weight or pressure with this guy. It feels very light, even though it does have a good bit of heft to it. And I will say the grip does have a little too much girth down here, more than I would like, um, but it's not bad. It's not, man it's not unmanageable, and I can get my hand gripped all the way around it. The angle on the grip is fantastic, though. And the little bulge back here, that kind of just fits right nicely into the palm of your hand. I do appreciate that. And it's a full finger grip, so big-handed people like Othias can certainly handle this guy without a problem. It's got a nice positive magazine button drop up here, which is fantastic. So modern, guys. Thank you. Um, the serrations on the back here of the bolt for easy pullback is really nice. I mean, everything about this gun just feels so user friendly. I love it. I mean, there really aren't too many negative things you could even say about this guy, but I'm guessing we're going to get into that a little bit later if there are any negatives, but for ergonomics, the feel and look of this gun is, is actually quite comfortable. It's nice. 
Again, all of these features were present on the first version in 1902. That predates a lot of the guns you're thinking of to compare this against. So again, Japanese were catching up really nicely. Now, of course, they were overused and the features were readopted in the 20s with another gun that we'll talk about another day. And that's where people start to get kind of where they're mocking the Nambu and laughing at how backwards it is. But all of this and even with the weird bottleneck small cartridge, perfectly normal for the turn of the century and honestly exceptional in design. So ergonomics aside, we now have to ask the more difficult question because not a lot of people have shot this gun. What's it like to actually fire the old Papa Nambu to actually put rounds down range? Because this is where we usually run into problems with early autoloaders. So would you walk us through that experience? First and foremost, I want to mention that there was a little bit of weird handling on this gun on range for me, and I need to explain why. It's got this front grip safety, which honestly, I think is fantastic. I love the front grip safety on this one. It's positive. It feels perfect for, there's no question exactly where to put your fingers on here. They just naturally fall like across it. It's perfect. However, on this gun in particular, we think the grip safety is, is a bit too worn out that this gun just needs a little bit of service because we noticed that unless I positively took my fingers off the grip safety and put them back on, the trigger wasn't being reset. So just bear that in mind in the shooting segment. It was a thing that I was actively having to do and I will not hold that against this gun because I know for a fact that in general, they weren't like that. This gun in particular needs the service to get that working perfectly. Um, so all that aside, let's get into the actual shooting part of it. The sights, they're actually, they're pretty tall, but I will say they're a little bit too rounded for my taste. Um, I wish they were just a little bit sharper. That being said, they're still tall. They're still easy to read. So decent job on the sights. It does kind of feel like I'm looking down the sights of a carbine though. And I will say that, which is interesting. Um, good sight radius. Love that. Um, the trigger is a bit creaky and mushy for the pull through. And that's because the trigger bar runs all the way down the length of the gun. It's not as bad as the Luger, but it's certainly not as good as the Lottie. It's just somewhere in between there. And I don't really know how to work around that as far as altering this internally. But yeah, I, I definitely know that that's the reason why the trigger was, was as mushy as it was, because you can even see it when you pull the trigger, the trigger bar shifting down here. It's kind of like you're working a teeter totter essentially is what it looks like. Um, the recoil on this gun. Now this was interesting. When I was shooting it, it didn't feel like there was much recoil or much snap to it. Honestly, I thought I was able to reline the sights very quickly and maybe it's because the sights were as good as they were and where the weight was, it just felt all right. But when watching it in slow motion, the recoil was actually pretty significant. You can see it. So it's just, it's interesting how I didn't perceive that as the shooter, it was as bad as it was when I watched the slow motion. I went, oh, it actually was a significant recoil. But it, it you don't really notice it as a shooter, which is really nice. Um, and then last but not least, the cartridge on this gun. I've got eight rounds of eight millimeter Nambu. Why is it eight millimeter Nambu? I feel like they could have gone with a stronger cartridge on this gun. I mean, I feel like they, they didn't do enough there. They could have just made it a little more powerful, but instead I'm shooting something within like 380 range. That's kind of ridiculous in my opinion. But that aside, shooting wise, it actually was a, it was a decent shooter. I had fun with it. I thought I was pretty accurate with it. I just wish they'd given me a little more powerful cartridge and worked on that trigger a little bit. I, th I think they could have probably altered it mechanically inside a little bit, but then again, I don't know I would have had to go into that. So that aside, it still was a fun, decent shooter. Yeah, may I uh, borrow that? Mm -hmm. So I agree with May, it feels great. It actually shoots way better than I expected because uh, I have shot the Type 14 and 94 and other weird Japanese handguns. I actually found this more pleasant than the 14 in a lot of ways, mostly because it did go bang. A lot of you have maybe tried out a 14 and noticed that the springs aren't that good, or the construction's not that good, or the firing pins break, or... This gun seems to have been built better than its descendant. Like, this is the older is better, in my mind anyway, although sample size of one. Who knows? Um, I will say there's some oddities. Number one, the rear sight, the fact that this gun, as the Papa, was never meant to really be fitted with the stock, except for, again, the tie contracts and initial Japanese Navy thoughts, 
it's very odd that it has an adjustable tangent rear sight. Yeah, it's, that is a bit strange. Like I said, it just kind of feels like you're shooting off a carbine instead of a pistol. Yeah, the later Type 14, you know, fixed sight's much better idea. And it has room for waggle, and I'm sure it bounces a bit. It's just an odd, odd choice, and it adds more weight, too. The other thing is I agree with May. It's a mild cartridge with a big locking action. And at the point of the weight that's into this gun now, with it all at the rear, I don't know why the locking action's there. You could have put a 380 in this added just a little bit more mass, and she would have locked up fine as a blowback. I mean, it, there's so much weight and movement back here that that's probably what explains the odd sort of reset time on this gun despite not feeling a lot of recoil force. That's probably why it's rocking so much in that slow motion video. Again, I don't know why they didn't just go to a blowback. But it doesn't seem like a cartridge that needs a locking action. Now, everybody says the 380 thing is roughly equivalent, that's true. There's some evidence that 8mm Nambu actually does better than 380. Like, it is a bottleneck, you know, fairly-ish high speed. And we can argue about the, the makeup of the bullet and the bullet weight and all that. That's a whole other thing for the comments. You guys go nuts all you want. Let's be honest, though. By the time we get into World War One, especially afterwards, 8mm Nambu is an obsolete cartridge, and there's better cartridges out there. And cartridges that could have possibly been paired with this action. Because, and I, by the way, I haven't done all, like, I'm not an engineer. I suspect that this locking action is probably stronger than the Glacenti. Because we knew the Glacenti couldn't handle 9mm Parabellum, so they went with 9mm Glacenti from that episode, the Italian episode. This is a more positive lock than the Glacenti. It's not a rolling, sort of, hold it shut thing that opens as it goes. This is an on and off positive lock. So I suspect you can get a little bit more out of this. And then going to the ergonomics, I just want to remind people, sorry, I know I'm holding the floor a bit, but uh, small factor, how comfortable this gun is to give you an idea. Don't forget that the Ruger target pistols were all based off of the Nambu, not in terms of locking, but in terms of ergonomics and feel and general layout. So it is that comfortable that this design persists today, modified in the American market for commercial use. So let me give this back to you, because that sets you up for sort of the final question. Would you take this gun into battle? This gun does have its problems. I mean, big action, smaller cartridge. Like, I feel like they could have buffed up that cartridge a little bit, but hey, you know, whatever. Um, oh, annoying complaint. Yeah, that's super annoying to have to deal with. Um, and yeah, and maybe reduce the girth a little bit here, maybe make the sights a little bit better, maybe don't go with weird little carbine sights. I mean, yeah, it's got its tiny issues. Tiny issues. I mean, I've still got eight rounds of 8mm Nambu, I'm still not going to complain, and this gun performed very well. Like I said, I'm not counting this against it, but it's a great concept for the, for the safety to be up here, and then... It's got a push button magazine release. I mean, it's got wonderful striations for me to grip the bolt back. The trigger is not terrible, but I mean, it. there were a lot of good things about this gun that there's no way I could say no to it. I would feel confident defending with this one. I would feel confident taking action with this gun. So yeah, this one's this one's going to get a good yes in my book. I think this is a, is a pretty strong candidate. Again, not ideal, but definitely over the line for acceptable. Oh, yeah. And then, by, again, in context, this is by World War One. This is this is the measure, right? We're thinking about World War One. Mm -hmm. Now, I bet you don't really want to throw that thing around in the mud too much, so you're counting on the holster to keep it clean. Well, I mean, yeah. Okay. So, this isn't her favorite. This is not top five, right? No, this doesn't get top five. I'm just excited about it because I'm... Guys, I'm coming off of the Type 26, and I'm coming up to this guy. Like, this is a decent step up, in my opinion. Yeah, what's your choice between these two? Uh, no... What? Papa Nambu, come on. As a Japanese officer at this time, your choices would have been to commercially pay for this big guy, get one of these guys, or there's some market like small 32 blowbacks that are available. It depends on the year. More and more would come in at different times. But if you're offered that, this, or a little 32, like, seven shot, what do you want? Well, obviously, I'm going to go with the Papa because, I mean, this one gives me eight rounds, and it's a it's an okay cartridge. It's not the best, but it's okay, and it fired reliably on range. Like, I, yeah, I'm going to go with this one. Okay. And then the other thing is, just because it happened to be something that we ran into while we were in the field but did not get around to recording because we were busy filming machine guns that day, you have handled a quote-unquote baby Nambu in its 7mm cartridge. It's so cute. Did you really want to add anything to that thing as the value of a military pistol? No, it's literally like you took this gun and shrunk it down. 
I mean, yeah, I've, I've got less girth here, so woo. That's really the only positive. The rest is all like, I've got a smaller cartridge. It's still just a snappy and it's smaller, so I don't have as much length in the grip. So yeah, no, I, it's, it's more of a symbol of authority than anything. It's not really a, what I think of for a military handgun. Yeah, it feels like the kind of thing that you'd want to shoot a person who is already standing perfectly still, and you'd want all the time in the world to pick where to shoot them. Yeah. And then, by the way, the big advantage of the baby is that it's just not as heavy. It's just to have a lighter Nambu on your hip and still have a Nambu. It, it, that's a gun for executing your own people rather than trying to defend against somebody else. That is not a very good military handgun. All right, so I think that's got us wrapped out. Uh, is there anything else you want to add about the Nambu? Nah, it's a cool gun, and I honestly love that I've been able to shoot the Papa, and I got to try a mini version too, so they're both neat. All right, well, I think that'll wrap it up. Papa Nambu, neat. Now, uh, check after the credits if you want to see any updates, and otherwise, thank you again for tuning in. Later, everyone. All right, just a couple of things to clear. One, I'm actually getting kind of busy in terms of personal things, family and medical, etc. So uh, my time is even more scarce. And we're at this point where it's getting really difficult to track down exactly what we need for certain episodes. And yes, there's some easier ones that can get done. And I know you guys keep pushing how hard is it to do this gun or that gun. It may just be that I'm trying not to do all of the easy ones and leaving myself all of the multi-thousand dollar, multi-hundred hour episodes to do at last. It would be nice to wrap on an easier piece where I have it accessible to me. This is called load balancing. So I know it could be easy to do a Mosin Nagan episode. I would like to thread it in along with a much harder episode so that I don't go crazy and gouge my own eyes out. All right, thank you for your understanding. And by the way, if you are about to send me an email that you want to see a particular gun, ask yourself, was it used by a belligerent nation in World War I? And do I own it to loan to them? Because if you do not, you are just wishing in the wind. I don't know where there's a Fedorov off to my, that I can fire. I do not know where there's a Fiat Ravelli where I can fire. If you know this, by all means, pass that information. But just yelling and cursing at me because I haven't magically made a gun appear is not going to move things along. Last ticket. I am going to probably be in North Carolina for the Salisbury show on the 17th. That is not a 100% guarantee as I still have two more days to get through to make sure of what my final schedule this weekend is. But I will make sure to make another note of it on Facebook and other social media. So if you're following us elsewhere, you can see whether or not I'm actually going to show up in just about 48 hours. All right. Thanks, everybody.